There are two works that are most formative to the early super robot genre. One, Machiner Z, is decently well known in the West. The other, Yusha Raidin, is not. Machiner Z aired on October of 1972 and ran for a respectable 92 episodes. It was succeeded by Great Machiner and a few months before that, Get a Robo. Each of those shows would run for over 50 episodes. Their success was made possible through a new model of television funding multiple sponsors, including a toy company. The Super Robot merchandise proved every bit as popular as the shows themselves. By the start of 1975, these were the only Super Robot shows that had been on television. All three Super Robot shows ran on the same television network, Fuji TV. All three had animation produced by the same animation studio, Toei Animation. And all three were based on intellectual property owned by Dynamic Productions. This small monopoly was about to be challenged. Yusha Raidin aired on April 4th. It ran on the NET network, was produced by the Tohoku Shinsa Film Corporation, with animation by Sunrise. It was the competitor to the dynamic production Super Robot Show. It was also one of the first examples in Japanese animation of an original work not based on a previously existing intellectual property. Mejiner Z had certainly been commercialized, but it was ultimately based on a comic that predated the toy. Yusha Raidin was expressively created to sell the transforming Raidin toy. By being an original work, its intellectual property could be more directly exploited. It had not been commercialized, it was just commercial. Yet Yusha Raidin the show is not just a commercial. While certainly formulaic, it is altogether too strange, too humorous and tragic, and even occasionally too uncomfortable for it to be dismissed that easily. Raidin had two directors over the course of the show, each of whom would continue to influence the super robot genre. Yoshiyuki Tomono directed episodes 1 through 26, while Tadao Nagahama directed episodes 27 through 50. Tomono is best known for the Mobile Suit Gundam series, Nagahama is not as familiar in the West, as he unfortunately died quite young, but he contributed to many prominent series, such as The Rose of Versailles. Nagahama also directed the pilot episode of the French-Japanese series Ulysses 31. <laughs> The show begins by introducing the lead character, the young and athletic Akira. He's captain of the school soccer team. <laughs> Suddenly, the earth shakes, the seas grow angry, and the great icons of civilization crumble and fall. <laughs>
A voice from the heavens summons a curate to the sea, and he is quick to obey, uh, much to the concern of his friends. At sea, Akira is suddenly accosted by monstrous beasts. <laughs> Leading these flying squid is the brash General Ngyaru. He causes trouble in quite a few episodes. <laughs> Things go from bad to worse as Akira is taken into a whirlpool. However, within the whirlpool... ピラミッドではないか。恐れるな。勇者よ。目覚めの時が来たのだ。ここに来人が待つ。隣を勇者。年神切り。隣を年神切り。年神切り。交渉困難。交渉困難。フェード。フェード。フェード。フェード。ライディン。ライディン。ライディン。うお、うん。我がウルトラスクリーンが乱れるとは。Rydeen. I'm going to come clean with my biases here, I love this kind of thing. As goofy as this is, the show expresses real flair here. The divine Rydeen is revealed from beneath the sea, within a pyramid, as a golden idol, and Akira brings it to life with a magic phrase and joins with it. It's great. Do note that Rydeen is divine. This is a notable distinction between Yusha Rydeen and previous Super Robot shows. In the earlier Mejinger Z, the titular robot was compared to a god, but here there's no such comparison. Akira receives a direct and undisguised mandate from the sky to find and operate Raidi, and it's explicit. <laughs> General Angyaro wastes no time ordering an attack, but Akira and Raidi easily hold their own. <laughs> Ha! 
But before we get too caught up in the action, let's rewind and examine some more of the cast. Akira's soccer buddies are prominent characters. Their comedic interludes and little vignettes fill pauses in the action and provide some humor to lighten the tension. They are much more loosely designed than Akira, writing or the villains. They can be drawn with fewer frames and more exaggeration, letting the animators devote more time to action scenes. They also provide exposition, and Raidin has a lot of exposition. Raidin has a lot of exposition. When things happen, often someone will exposit on it. As for what is being exposited at this particular moment, we're told that Akira's father, Ichiro, is also at sea. He works aboard a Mutron research ship. Ichiro is General Ngyaro's target. He didn't actually fly out here to harass a kid on a speedboat, but to harass an adult on a research ship. ああ。気をつけろ、お父さん。敵は敵は父さんたちを狙っているんだ。そ、その声は俺はアキラ。父さんは中へ入っててください。あの巨人め、ガンテの黒い稲妻でも Akira takes on a few more flying squid, but is ultimately unable to engage in Gyaro or to prevent him from escaping. Akira! 
キラしっかりしろあアキラキ,キャプテンまた来てしまったアキラ君アキラ今何と言ったライディーン何ライディーン一体何が起こったんでしょう先生ライディーンモー大陸の古い記録にはライディーンは目覚めて悪魔と戦うと記されている悪魔の時代が始まったのだアキラ、アフレティックリーダーのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギリスのサークルチーム、イギ Just from this first episode, a number of things are evident about the show's style. The colors are vivid with painterly backgrounds, the characters are all boldly outlined in black and are arrayed in solid primary colors, except for the villains who are portrayed in secondary colors that are ever so slightly muddied. r i g h t e a d itself is especially brightly colored. The show's whole color palette is very Crayola. The music is a mix of orchestra and synths, almost like disco at times. There are a lot of insert songs,、uh, lyrical theme songs that play over particularly dramatic montages or fight scenes. Masato Shimon, who also worked on Gachaman and Kamen Rider, provides vocals for these. He also did the Jet Jaguar theme in Godzilla vs. Megalon. The show makes use of time filling techniques. There are a lot of long, establishing shots, the pacing of action scenes is often too leisurely. And certain animations might be repeated several times over the course of an episode. There is one more aspect of the show that is worth mentioning that hasn't been touched on yet, and it concerns the villains. The small skeletal man is Barazdan, a priest of Barao, something of a rival god to Raidin. Each episode, Barazdan beseeches Barao to give life to a fossil beast, a kind of monster robot with which the villains will challenge Raidin. Barazdan and General Ngyaro are both subordinates to the major villain of the first arc. <laughs> お前が破れたというライディーンの姿を一度見せてもらおう。アナイスヘイ、はい、!This is Prince Sharkin. He's the final major character to be introduced, the lead antagonist. He has command of the demons and their fossil beasts, and is something of a villainous analog to Akira. バオラよ悪魔の時代の完成を邪魔する者は必ず打ち倒します。出撃He's in good graces with his god, is respected by his subordinates, and he has a crowd of ghostly fangirls who adore him. He may well have been the most popular character on the show. From this point forward, each weekly episode begins with the villains summoning a fossil beast, enacting some plan to undermine Raidin's strength, and will conclude with Akira and Raidin triumphing despite all odds. Here is a scene from episode 12 where Mr. Jinguji, a minor character who pilots a ridiculous aircraft, takes the buddy for a ride. Mr. Jinguji, can you see the plane? 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 コッペすぐあれだねえねえキャプテンカンカンのカーンに怒ってたよ
コッペを降ろさないのですかミスターコッペが死んだ弟みたいな気がしてな弟車にはねられちまったがねコッペ弟の代わりだパトロールに付き合えよこんな This is pretty raw.、Uh, Ariso's reaction is truly uncomfortable. It's, it's a genuinely affecting moment. But there's a catch. His mother isn't actually dead, and she's even ridiculing him through within her paralysis. There's clearly a joke here, but what is it? Are, are we supposed to laugh at Ariso for being too dumb to realize his mother's alive? Are we supposed to mock his mother for getting her just desserts? Are we supposed to laugh at all? Maybe it will help to watch one scene further. What? This is the sound! Is it scary? It's scary, it's scary, it's scary. I'm not going to die! Hey, come on!
Akira can only watch as the monster they got Raiso's mother derails a passenger train, presumably killing several. This episode doesn't merely bounce between moods, it veers between them. But the episode isn't even over. From here, Raizo's mother goes on to recover, Riding beats this week's monster, and there's even time on the clock for one last joke before the credits. <laughs> Uh, this is wild, and while no single episode flips between tones quite as rapidly, this is present throughout the series. Another solid example is the fate of the giant ape Gonger in episode 19. ゴリラ、グレートゴンが今陸揚げされております。怪獣8トン、身長はなんと15メートル。なぜこのようなゴンが生まれたか。日本科学協会の今後の研究によって証明されましょう。よし、時間、時間。おらおらおらおらおらお
runs rampant for a bit, but recovers his wits when he re-encounters Marie. is finally put down by Rydeen. And there's your moral for the episode. Take from that what you will. Now, the tone of this episode doesn't shift quite as egregiously as in the episode about Oriso's mother. It's mostly tragic, but only so long as you ignore that the tragedy is happening to a giant pink ape. It wavers between frighteningly violent imagery and absurd comic-like exaggeration. It's half King Kong, half Tasmanian Devil, where at the end, Taz Kong dies. One final example of the show mixing up comedic and tragic elements. <laughs> <laughs> this, once again, is General Ngiaro. As a character, he has two roles. First, to arrogantly boast of his inevitable victory. And then... <laughs> to lament his inevitable defeat. He's regularly the most entertaining part of the show, but it does not last. あ、ゲアル。最近ベロスさん、悪魔剣法第47条により本日ただいまアゲアル将軍の将軍職を辞めさせる。え、なんですって何の理由でタランチョ、私の許可なく出動させたこと。それに今までライディンを倒せなかった
After this, Raiden fights and chases off a spider robot. あきらちゃん、いっそのことこちらから先手を打ってはいかがなものでしょう。先手を打つって。おし、そいつ行っただけだよ。行けないわ。東山所長やコップランダーと相談するべきよ。ああ、無駄無駄。あの分からずやれん
ギャル覚悟That's it for General Angiaro. He's been an enjoyable clown for 18 episodes, but after one last entertaining scheme, he's out for good. And what do his compatriots think of this? The show's willingness to be totally dissonant is startling at first, but it makes such heavy use of it that it starts to become expected. The mood settles into an uneasy anxiety. There's more to this than just a clash of tones. This is happening during what is, however cartoonishly, presented as a real war, and the characters are shown suffering the consequences of that war. In this context, the baffling humor and the melodramatic grief come across almost like a coping mechanism, as if the show itself are working through its trauma alongside its characters. The show explores one character's trauma in particular detail, that of the lead, Akira. Akira's character is consistent with a typical male lead for any young boy-oriented show then or now. He's tall, athletic, a leader. He's friends with everyone, he takes his responsibilities seriously, but he's not so straight-laced. He's a biker with a preposterously cool bike. He's not just a role model, he's cool in the way that the 4-9 to nine year old boy demographic would find cool. A perfectly designed by committee lead. But his life isn't quite that simple. One of the earliest things to note is that, for all the friends he's shown to have, being responsible for Raideen is something that isolates him. The very first episode starts with him leaving his friends behind to get to Raideen. Episode 2 has him recognize his friends as he drives past them to attend to heroic responsibilities. In episode 3, Akira's enjoyed a nice meal with his team when he's called away once more. This continues to be a thing throughout the series. Keep in mind that the show introduces Akira becoming responsible for Raideen roughly at the same time his father is turned to stone and taken away by the enemy. A causality can be read here. Akira has to take on more responsibility because his dad is gone. Accepting this premise suggests a few other things as well. For example, how come Akira is the only kid with a cool bike? Perhaps because Akira is the only kid who's picking up a paycheck. But enough about Akira's absent father. Let's talk about Akira's absent mother. Huh? Huh? 
どうしたのかね響きああ<笑>夢か響き<笑>夢無理の罰にグランドサジェッシュ全力疾走はーいあの赤ん坊の鳴き声は耳について離れない Akira's mother has been gone since he was very young, and it's the cause of a great deal of anxiety for him. Ne, Akira, you be e k a t a k i c h a t a wa? Minna ni c h o k a na? Eh? Nani wo? Negoto yo, oka san nan te sa? Ma sa ka, kuno ore ga sona koto yu wake nai daro. In the absence of a mother, his girlfriend Marie fulfills a maternal role. <laughs> Ita wa, Akira! <laughs> She frequently cares for Akira, which he often needs, as being in charge of Raidin is not just dangerous but also incredibly stressful work. At several points, Akira nearly cracks as the responsibility gets to him. じいちゃん。いつから思えばそんな弱虫になったコッペの必死の望みも叶えてやれんのかでも俺にはその自信がないんだ。たわけ。自信がなければ自信がつくようにせい。よいか、ライディンはお前と一心同体なのじゃ。
and even when everything goes right and he wins and saves the day, the strain of operating Rydeen is shown to have a heavy price. Akira can be given as many goofy airplanes and as much love and support as you please, but it's all conditional. He can never be allowed to quit. To bring all these thoughts together, the show's designed by committee boy protagonist is a schoolboy who works because his family isn't around to support him. The girl character is a replacement mother and girlfriend who supports her man. The Mala Society helps him, but only so he can continue to perform his duties, since that society is dependent on his labor. There's a tension throughout the series in how Akira, Raiden, and their duties are portrayed. The opening shows all of Akira's friends cheering him on as heroic music plays. But during the show itself, we see something quite different. We see that being the special super robot pilot is terribly and inherently traumatic. As was mentioned much earlier, Yusha Raiden is a show with two story arcs. The first arc encompasses the first 27 episodes of the show, 26 of which were directed by Yoshiyuki Tomino. However, after episode 26, there was a changing of the guard, and Tadao Nagahama became the director from there on out. Episode 26 is almost like a retrospective. This episode's robot monster resurrects the monster of previous episodes. Akira fights them all, gets beat up, and has to retreat. There's a B-plot where Akira's school friends get into mischief and he has to bail them out. Then his buddies burn their clothes to provide a distraction so he can save the day. None of that is ex as exciting as it sounds, and it's ultimately rather dull. This was Yoshiyuki Tomino's final episode. Let's see how Tadao Nagahama begins his first. あ、ご許しください。バラオ様。私は悪いございました。全ては私の責任でございます。ああ。もう分かりました、バラオ様。旅から去る失敗。お腹立ちはごもっとだ。ですから、借金様は今度こそ自らの命を懸けて来人目を
から秘密の電波が送信されてきています何よしすぐ波長を合わせろはい響きアキラ久しぶりだなシャキお前にいいものを見せてやろういいもの一体なんだ<笑>父を助けたくばアキラこの火山島までやってくるがよいわかった待ってろ今すぐ行くアキラ来ちゃいかん恐ろしい罠がどうぞ待って罠だきっと何か罠がある行っては危ないぞアキラ罠でも何でも俺は行く待って待って必ず帰ってきて Akira overcomes a number of obstacles to arrive at this island. Admiral Dalden, who replaced the deceased General Ngyaru, traps Raidin in some Sonic the Hedgehog rings and then tries to bombard him. Akira escapes, destroys the Dragon Hand ship, and then chases down Dalden as he tries to escape in a finger. <laughs> もっとスピードを上げろおのれそろそろ島が見える頃だあの島だ響きアキラだ父を連れ戻しに来た There's one final fight against the fossil beast and after that we get to the main event 手間取った一刻も早くお父さんをさすがライディよく無事に私のところまで来られたなこうなったら私が相手だ正気かその体でどうやって戦う I'm going to come clean with my biases. こうやってだバラオーおお I love this kind of thing.
きながら立派だったぜお前がもし味方だったらな Why is Akira giving so much consideration to the man that kidnapped his father, caused countless damage and death, and waged war against him? To understand that, we should realize that Yusha writing isn't really a story about good and evil, with Akira as the good and Sharkin as the evil. It's a story about warring gods. And the people involved with them. Akira is the champion of Raiden, or perhaps whatever god is behind Raiden, and Sharkin is the champion of Barao. Raiden may be good, and Barao may be evil, but in the larger context, this is a minor distinction. It's Raiden's and Barao's prerogative to make more with one another, and it's Akira and Sharkin's duty to fight and to die. シャーキンは死んだだが悪魔は必ずまた蘇るライディーンの活躍はこれからですね父さんそうだアキラお前の任務はますます重くなるのだ Akira's father is saved, but the conflict isn't over. Partly, this is because Mr. Nagahama was just signed up for another 20 some episodes, but more than that, it's because the conflict depicted in writing isn't one that can have an end. The fight goes on until the gods are satisfied. Akira's and Sharkin's role is ritualistic. They fight, they struggle, they labor on behalf of things that, benevolent or otherwise, are inhuman. Their lives are inherently forfeit. Yusha Raiden was the only super robot show in 1975 not produced by Dynamic Productions. In 76, there were five, and in 77, there would be another six. All in all, there would be at least two super robot shows produced every year until 1986. Yusha Raiden proved that a series could be successful without adapting a pre existing work. All you needed was airtime, an animation studio, and a toy company to fund it. And you could skimp on the animation. Most of the super robot shows that were produced in the wake of Raiden were extremely derivative. The most notable among them wouldn't be produced until the 80s. The big exceptions are the work of Yoshiyuki Tomono and Tadao Nagahama. Raiden was their first super robot show, but it would not be the last for either of them. And they would prove the Super Robot style, for all its ritualistic formulas, to be surprisingly adaptable. Mr. Nagahama would follow up his work on Raiden with Combatler V, which is mostly notable for having a much more lighthearted tone and generally being a better produced show. However, he followed that up with Voltus V. In Voltus V, the heroes fight against racist, colonialist, French aristocrats from space. 
people of Earth are able to fight them off using technology given to them from the space revolutionaries. And after fighting off the invaders, the people of Earth repay their debts by going to Space France to participate in the Space French Revolution. The final victory is portrayed as both a heroic step towards a more universal equality and liberty, and simultaneously a tragic semi-fratricide. Mr. Tomino, not to be outdone, followed up work on writing with Zambot 3. In Zambot 3, the heroes are refugees from space who fled a conflict which destroyed their home planet and which eventually follows them to Earth. It takes a stark look at prejudice, terrorism, and violence and uses the super-robot Conceit as a vehicle to examine these issues from a child's perspective. It is a famously bleak show, but also an incredibly earnest one. After that, Tomino would direct Mobile Suit Gundam, a show I hardly need to comment on. Each of those shows are good, and several are excellent. Yusha writing largely is not. But all of those shows built off of Yusha writing in a clear way. The character of Sharkin, that of a lead antagonist that is not only pointedly non-monstrous, but also attractive and aristocratic, is re-explored several times. But while in writing, Sharkin was loyal until his dying breath, those that followed him would range from vengeful to traitorous. In Nagahama's Combatler V, the shocking character, Great General Garuda, turns against his god after discovering that he's been misled. In Voltus V, the shocking character, Prince Heimel, unwittingly fights on behalf of those who would destroy him. In Tomino's mobile suit Gundam, Shar self-destructively wars against everyone. The dynamics between humans and the seemingly divine are also re-examined, but while the characters in writing never question their faith, the shows that followed would make a point of it. The climax of Zambot 3 is a confrontation between the all-to-human Cape and Computer Doll No. 8, an autonomous war machine which considers its total war on humankind to be a just and preemptive defense against the people it views as evil. In Tomino's later Idian, in one of the final episodes of the show, human Best Jordan and the godlike Ide interrogate each other on the suffering of war. It's unclear if either of their answers satisfies the other. In this way, both Tomino and Nagahama's later work reveal a dissatisfaction with Yusha Raidin. Maybe Sharkin's character should not have been so undeveloped. Maybe Akira's servitude to Raidin and his community shouldn't have been so unexamined. Maybe the gods, good and bad, should not have been quite so unquestionably obeyed. But in Yusha Raidin, that's how it was. In a sense, later shows can be seen as refutations of, or perhaps transformations of, the Yusha Raidin story. Yusha writing is a dissatisfying show. There's a few moments of excitement and some genuine panache, but on the whole it's quite a mediocre, married to the formula, trash anime. Even the fan subber had trouble keeping enthused. But for all of that, it is fascinating and its undeveloped nature only heightens this. This is a show where a character's emotionally abusive mother bounces in and out of the grave like if Schrodinger's cat couldn't decide if he wanted to be let out or to stay inside. This is a show where a character out of the same old as Boris, Natasha, or Meowth is shown dying miserably. This is a show where the hero is routinely brutalized. This is a show where the villain is shown committing ritual suicide. These events, whether portrayed tragically or humorously, are nonetheless shown plainly, matter-of-factly. That is just how it is in the world of the show. For all that the show is trash, the casual presentation, simplistic structure, narrative, and creole aesthetic all come together to make the struggles and traumas of its world seem truthful. For all that the show is the original toy commercial anime, it still presents its committee-designed reality as harmful, as undesirable. Despite everything against it, it still comes across genuine. If later shows transform to the story of Yusha Raidin, it's because there is something in the writing that was deserving of transformation. Oh, 
私はあんな響きアキラやライディンに負けたのではない一人のチビのためにクソ覚えておれ今度こそ